Well, welcome everybody. It's great to have you here. Uh, this is John Sviokla. I'm here with my good friend, Rob Spivey. And we're gonna spend about an hour together um, trying to help folks stop punishing the innovators. And this is the maiden voyage of our uh, Growth Innovators Speaker Series. I'm really excited to do this. Um, and uh, we think this is really important uh, because if you look at the overall global economy and the domestic economy, we need more innovation. We need successful innovators. Um, and so we're gonna have a whole series of efforts to make that happen. I looked at some of the registrants and I know there's some old friends out there and some new folks. So um, we will run this very casually. Please feel free to uh, put questions into chat and we will try to deal with them uh, as they uh, come up or fit. And um, let us go ahead and get started. And as I like to do, I'm gonna uh, start with the end in mind which is there's really two things Rob and I would like you to get out of this. One is that if you're the kind of person who is um, uh, funding innovation or have people working for you who are worried about it or trying to grow a business, we hope at the end of this, you'll have a better perspective on the right time frame and tools and ways of doing that to really help people in your organization create those breakthrough innovations. And if you're on the other end of this, that is you're somebody looking for money, uh, trying to get resources, trying to innovate, um, that you can set a better argument for the time frame and the nature of how you should be measured. People, any entrepreneur or innovator who's serious is happy to be measured, but it should be measured over the right time frame. Put another way, you can't put a tomato plant in the backyard, stand over two days later and say, where are my tomatoes? So we're going to deal with that. Um, so let us, let me take you through here. Um, here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to start with the idea of the law of computability, which will be a theme that we'll see across a bunch of these um, times together. And fundamentally, uh, I believe, and we believe at Digital Intent that the world is getting transformed by becoming more and more computable. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, and that that is changing how you should innovate, where you should innovate, and certainly how you should measure innovations, much more concerned for intangibles, which we'll get into in some depth today. So I really think of it as a framework of digital transformation where you should uh, think about it. And also, if you can compute something that somebody else can't, you win in the marketplace. Uh, second thing we're going to look at is a macro movement toward intangibles. Uh, and Rob's got some really interesting data based on over 25,000 companies globally that are updated quarterly. Um, I'm going to go into the fallacy of financial tools a little bit. This is some work that Clay Christensen, uh, the late great Clay Christensen, colleague of mine when I was at Harvard Business School, shows how NPV really is not the right way to think about innovation. Or if you are going to think about it that way, you have to adjust it. Uh, we're going to do a little poll in terms of how long is your payback period at your company or your organization. Uh, then we're going to take that through a tale of two leaders. And I'm basically going to show through some of the work with Valens and so forth, how IBM is disinvesting and crushing their business and Microsoft is investing and growing their business and why that's a problem. Uh, then we're going to get very tactical. We're going to go from the broad to the narrow and get at how might you uh, elongate or change the nature of the timeline in your firm so you can match it to value and get those resources that you need. I'll give you a quick idea of what we're going to do in terms of our next thing. Uh, we we're doing these the last Friday lunch, lunch Eastern time every month. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about Toby Redshaw and tips from a corporate renegade, which will be our next one. And then Rob's going to tell us a fantastic story. Uh, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, on where did long and short come from in the context of stocks. So that's what it is. And then uh, We'll uh, certainly take any questions and contact information. You'll get these handouts. We do everything under Creative Commons license. Rob, anything to add before I dive in here? No, looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. So um, uh, just for those of you who don't know me, um, uh, a couple of years ago, I retired from uh, PwC uh, as chief marketing officer there. Um, I was there for about eight years on innovation and things like that. Um, then I was a, um, a senior executive at uh, Diamond Technology Partners for about a dozen years. I was a professor at Harvard Business School before that. Rob, I'm so glad. Uh, I've known Rob for about 20 years. I'm delighted to be on our maiden voyage with him because uh, in the apocalypse, Rob would be one of the guys I'd want in the canoe or in the ark because um, he is uh, as brilliant as he is resourceful. Um, now, you start out... Uh, 
from Northeastern with a major in finance and then a minor in philosophy. And if, if we have enough time, you'll see that philosophy degree come out. Um, and he started out uh, in, uh, in terms of being an analyst. Uh, he worked for uh, Abernathy Group, Credit Suisse, and then co-founded Valens. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I have an investment in Valens and the Valens folks help manage my wealth. I believe in what they do. Um, and so uh, you will see some of the fruit of that labor. He also co-founded the Uniform uh, Adjusted Financial Reporting Standards Council, which is the general argument for basically, I think of it as looking at value, not looking at regulation in terms of how you report things. And Rob's mm -hmm. kind of interesting guy, he's an avid skier, but what's fun is that he was saying that, um, I was asking about his family stuff, he said, uh, you know, uh, my mom was an accountant, is an accountant, and she worked for defense, uh, contractors over the years. And he said, they go back and forth on, you know, what's more screwed up the balance sheet of the income statement. So I don't know about you, but that's not what I grew up with over my dinner table. So Rob, Rob has a passion for this as it will show through uh, and delighted to have him here. So let me just give you an idea who digital intent is. Uh, we're a consulting firm. Um, and we also have uh, in our group an affiliation with a venture firm and a build firm. Um, and our passion really is growth. And we use all the levers of growth, whether it's venture funding, business analysis, uh, incubation, acceleration, and so forth. Uh, and we also have a number of academics, ex-academics. So we also really believe in training and transferring of knowledge because uh, growth is not an easy thing. It's necessary, but not easy. And here's some of the clients that we worked for. Um, let me start in on the law of computability. Um, think about... <laughs> Uh, what's going on in the uh, economy. The, the law of computability starts with the idea that there's a level of knowledge of the phenomenon of interest of the job to be done. How well do we know it? And think about that as categorization. We can say, look, that's, that's a fast one. That's a slow one. That's an easy one. That's a hard one. That's categorization. Correlation. Uh, when you see the fast one, you also usually see the pink one, right? Causation. Actually, the fast one starts to make the pink one happen. And those are three levels of knowledge. And kind of what's our level of knowledge of the task of interest? And the second thing is how digitized is the job to be done? Level of knowledge times computability equals digitization, all right? Uh, uh, sorry, equals computability. Level of knowledge times digitization equals computability. Level of knowledge times digitization equals computability. And let me give you a specific example of bring this alive. Here's uh, one of the Google cars that they put around the uh, you know campus. And when the Google car started, and we uh, heard this from Chris Ermson, the head engineer uh, at the event called The Exchange that I was running for, for Pricewaterhouse and for Diamond. And he's the senior engineer at the Google car. And in this, in my lingo around, uh, computability, the car itself was relatively computable, right? The physics, the electronics, and so forth, you could model the car and even the car in, in motion in terms of the behavior of the car. But the car's environment, where it was driving, was in fact not digitized. You see the little thing on the top of this thing kind of looks like a, a hat on top of the car? That's a LIDAR, which is a laser scanner. And, and, the, and the early ones spun around and they paint the world with a with a laser and they collect 1.5 million pieces of data per second. That's the old ones, the new ones do much more per second. And what they do with that is they create a 3D model of reality that the car then drives through. So the challenge of creating the self-driving car was not, not the level of knowledge of the job to be done. We understand the physics of the environment. It was the digitization. And so by doing the, the digitization, they could then start to create a much deeper level of knowledge. And so that's what I mean by computability. And you can look at the same thing, whether it's the way progressive or direct line, progressive in the US, direct line in the UK do uh, life insurance issuance, or you start to look at how Uber uh, or Amazon does um, forecasting of, of planning. Uh, for inventory, they have a patent now where they ship inventory into a demand, possible demand cloud. That's all about increasing the computability. And this is different than automation because with automation, you only get rid of the labor. With computability, you, you can get rid of labor or change the nature of labor, and you also get a symbolic description of the behavior, which has ongoing value, a great intangible. Lots more to say about that, but we will see this notion of computability is really the heart, the beating heart of what is transforming 
commerce as we know it. And the reason it's relevant today is, well, let me let Rob get into this in a second. The reason this is relevant today is that the more digitized and computable the reality comes, becomes the more that traditional measures depart from economic value creation. So the more digitized, the more uh, intellectualized, the more intangible assets drive value, the more the traditional ways we think about this are wrong and actually driving us, pun intended, in the wrong direction. So Rob, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that before you head on into this baby. No, I think, yeah, I think it's exactly right. And if you look at, you know, one of the things that we focus on from a uniform accounting perspective, right? And the background around uniform accounting is this idea of cleaning up the financial statement so we can get an understanding of not what is the compliance exercise that is accounting, but what is what real economic performance of a business is. And what it does is it paints that exact same picture that intangible assets and that investment and innovation is getting more important relative to physical assets. What this chart shows you here is really simple, right? So for those of you who know, don't know, PP&E, PP e is property, plant, equipment. Think factories, think buildings, think offices, think computers, think retail shops. When this slope is sloping down in this chart, net to gross PP&E ratio, that means that on average over the last 20 years, physical assets, physical tangible assets, that factory that you see when you drive down the road, they're getting older. Companies are investing less in them. Right? And the reason why is because of where companies are actually redeploying capital. You look at this chart and you might think that means, oh, companies are disinvesting in their businesses. They are shrinking and they are actually starving their companies of capital. And yet when we look at a real valuation with a market Rob, thinking, Rob, can I, yeah, can go I ahead, back John. up one second? If you just back up a second. Folks, I want you to understand where this is coming from. So uh, the things you're going to see going forward, most of them come from the following. Rob's company, which he helped found, has, a, has about a dozen folks in the U.S. and has about 125 people in the Philippines who have yep. been who have been trained in uh, accounting for U.S. accounting and also for uh, for European and U.K. accounting. What they do is every quarter, they update 25,000 public companies across all markets around the world, and they do the proper adjustments. So, you know, you're actually looking at apples to apples comparison as you look at so any of these data and data I will show you, for example, I will show you how IBM has just invested in R&D over the past 10 years to the tune of $5 billion. So they're harvesting the past. If those who are interested, you wanted to say to me, John, where did you get that number? I can go back to any cell in a matrix, in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet back 20 mm -hmm. years and show you the original number as reported and then how that was adjusted to today's number so that you can actually do an apples to apples comparison. So this isn't, uh, I just want to tell you, Rob's not coming from the point of view of somebody who read The Economist and is doing this at an aggregate level. This is up literally from cell by cell of 25,000 companies over 20 years across the world. Okay, so just because Rob's fairly humble, I just want to let you know this is this is grounded, very grounded. Yeah, and just, yeah, I didn't want to put everybody to sleep, but for background, what we do is, as John said, for those 25,000 companies that we look at globally, we make over 130 different adjustments to the financial reporting standards. These include things like we'll focus on here, like capitalizing R&D, things like how noisy mergers and acquisitions make accounting, things like um, stock option expense and the right ways to deal with that, non-operating expenses, cash versus non-cash charges, et cetera, just for context of what we're doing to be able to give this picture in a way that actually represents accounting reality. And so what's so interesting here is you see companies disinvesting in physical assets. And so you'd assume that's a bad thing. And yet when we use the uniform accounting data to understand how the market's valuing companies, the market's actually paying a higher premium every single year for companies relative to just assets. What this chart is, we call this VA prime or valued asset prime. Very simply, what it's saying is when we take every single investor in a company and look at the value that all of them ascribe to, to a company, in this case for the whole entire US, that's the enterprise value of a business. That's basically how much the company is worth in the market. Then we compare that to our cleaned up asset base, right? Once we deal with the idea of 
tangible and intangible assets and, and clean up the noise. And what we're seeing here is right now today, every dollar of investment that U.S. corporates have put in their business, the market is valuing at $3.30. That's up from $1.80 as recently as 2010, right? 1.8 to 3.3. Now, you might look at that and you might say, oh, okay, this is because the market's irrational, right? I mean, we're in the middle of COVID and we've got valuations at all-time highs and stock markets at all-time highs. The market just doesn't get it, right? And what you might write and look at this, especially when you think about disinvesting in physical assets, the reality is, though, the fundamentals back up where the market's going. So this chart, again, is another way that we look at not what the market thinks a company is worth, but how profitable is a company really? This is return on assets. So we look at all U.S. corporates and we look at what is the cash they're throwing off from the investments that, we're making, that they're making. And we're seeing this is rising towards all-time highs. And why? You'd say, how could this be happening if they're not investing in their businesses? It's not because they're not investing in their businesses. It's because they're changing the buckets they're investing in. They're not investing as much in PP&E anymore because they understood that I can't earn a high return as high return off of my physical assets alone. Instead, what they're doing is they're redeploying that into intangible asset investment too, which is what we can see when we look at the exact same chart we looked at before for PP&E, for property, plant, and equipment, but we look at it for R&D investment. One of the things that we do with all of the 130 different adjustments we do is we understand the idea that R&D really is an investment. And this is one of the things that John, that John and I are going to talk a lot about during this call. The idea is if you think of R&D as an expense, you are missing one of the most important investments you're making as a company. And if you don't correctly capture that investment, you won't have a really holistic picture of how good is your company really doing. What this chart is showing you is on average, just like how we saw, right, as the chart went like this, for net to gross pp e ratio, it declined. That meant assets are getting older. Companies are starving themselves of physical investment. For, for R&D, we're seeing companies invest more in R&D over time. For context, just in terms of scale, by the way, that move from, let's say, 2014, when we were at a 63% net to gross R&D investment to 66, that represents $1.2 trillion of incremental investment in R&D over that period. So this isn't a small sliver of what companies are spending on, but this is just a fraction of what we talk about in tangibles. And it's this change in how companies are spending and how that spending is impacting profitability and market valuation, right, and how the market perceives you, that if you're not looking at it the same way the investors are, the market is looking at it, you're not going to be communicating the same way. And if management isn't thinking about it that way, you're going to miss out on the opportunities that the market's going to reward you for most. And it speaks from the macro. John, I hope that wasn't too long, but I just wanted to give everybody context there. No, it sounds good. Um, and I just want to double check. The software told me that uh, folks can't hear me. Could uh, Phyllis... Uh, Please just tell me if you can, if you cannot hear me or there's an issue uh, in the chat, uh, public chat. Thank you. Uh, the uh, uh, So the, the just wanted to give folks an idea on a company by company. Well, first of all, Rob said the 1.6 trillion, I think you said. Uh, 1.2, yep. Uh, 1.2, sorry. Um, do I remember right that the U.S. GDP this year is about 17 trillion? Just to give that some perspective. Yeah, it's probably closer to 20 trillion at this point, I think. But yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, closer to 20 trillion. Anyway, just to give some perspective, uh, the um, the uh, the other thing is underneath this, if you go company by company, sometimes the adjustments don't make much difference, and sometimes they make a lot of difference. So, in the mm -hmm. past, for example, I you know think about three, four years ago. Facebook's reported return on assets was uh, 13, 14, 15%, somewhere in there. Their actual return on assets properly adjusted was about 60%, that is 60%. So uh, it varies a lot by company. And what you're looking at here again is the aggregate uh, across all these different companies. Uh, so uh, we have a question here is, uh, pp and &E concentrated into the hands of specialized companies. So assets are too expensive. So people are outsourcing manufacturing. Good question for Merrick. Good to have you here, Merrick. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great question. And it really is. The, the, the reason why we look holistically at everything, and also if we were to look at, say, if you were going to say China is factory Asia, right, or you're going to say elsewhere in the world that, where, that companies are basically pushing off their pp and &E to somebody else, 
the reality is you see this trend throughout most of the world. Um, so if we look at right, the contract manufacturers in Singapore, in China, in Taiwan, even, I mean, to a certain extent, the rest of Southeast Asia and then on to India, you can see that you're not seeing surges in pp &E. It's not like we're just moving, right? The cup is not like we're just moving and pushing things around the table. It's in reality an overarching trend here where things are going. Um, so it's a great, it's a great question though. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, one of the benefits of doing this is a global database too, I think, you know, um, so yeah. now, um, if there are any other questions on the macro level, please feel free. We'll again, return to this and, and really feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Uh, the, uh, I'm not a believer that there aren't any dumb questions. There are dumb questions, but, uh, I'm sure you'll come up with good ones. The, uh, the, um, <laughs> So I'd like to turn, we've been talking about the macro level. Uh, uh, oh, uh, interesting question. Uh, Stu Rosenberg asks, uh, are we seeing any distortions due to stock, buy stock buybacks shrinking the base? Yep. And that's, it's another reason why when we go to the valued asset prime chart, um, which is uh, the chart here, the reason why we look at things from a uh, from an enterprise value perspective and we look at things from an aggregate perspective as opposed to a per share perspective is exactly because of the noise that you just talked about. When we talk about IBM, not to steal our story later, but you realize no, one of the following yeah. that IBM has had is um, is actually around um, basically share buybacks and how those impact things like EPS and how you can play games. If you're looking at a metric that's, um, I wouldn't say too simplistic, but is not complete and holistic. So when we look at VA, we're specifically looking at the market cap of a company, which sees through buybacks and also the, the book debt of a company too. So we can understand also when we see capital structure changes too, it's all captured there because it's so important. Gotcha. So you, you, you can hack around with the denominator, but it's not going to change the, the total value. Exactly. Yeah, the, that's, uh, that's right. Uh, John Lombard asked an interesting question around, um, you know, do you worry how any trust type legislation might affect digitized companies whose advantages continue to compound due to their ability to invest? Uh, I would uh, personally, I think that uh, my guess would be you, have, you might have a short term hit on those companies. But then if you look back uh, when the baby bells were broken up uh, and AT&T broke up, my memory of it, and, and, and the problem with ever talking about valuation with Rob around is like having a, a family argument with my wife. You know, he he both knows more and remembers more than 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 I would ever know. But my memory of it, and stop me with facts any time here, Rob, is that the once the regional bell operating companies called the Arbox were sent out, they actually had more capitalization than AT and T by itself. So, John, I would think that yep. perhaps in the short term, but um, I would actually say if you look at um, if you look at some of the, 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 if you look at Fang, you know, Facebook, Apple, Google, uh, Microsoft, uh, and uh, I'm forgetting one. Uh, anyway, and then Netflix. Baidu, what's that? I said uh, Netflix. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I was thinking more at a higher level. Uh, anyway, the big guys. And then the Chinese ones, right? Baidu, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, JD. Uh, that I would actually look at the past number of years and, and wonder if you couldn't have had a lot more innovation if they didn't have so much market dominance because uh, there's so many places to innovate. But that's that's to be found, and we'll see where this antitrust thing against Microsoft uh, against Facebook goes. Um, yeah, and the one thing I just add to that really quick, John, is you know one of the things is you know when you determine rewarding people for innovation or returning people for any rewarding it people for anything that they do, which causes them to do it more. The really interesting mm -hmm. thing that's happened is well. Well, you could argue that um, the anti-competitive things that Facebook, et cetera, has done to consolidate their markets, if you, if you view it that. The interesting thing is from an innovator's perspective, um, and you think about it from, you know, think about Instagram, think about WhatsApp. Those people are not dis, um, they, they're not unrewarded for the innovation that they're doing. They're actually just rewarded by being pulled into a public company. So if you think about the economic mechanisms for what drives you to really want to invest and innovate, they still actually mm -hmm. exist, even though even though those things are happening. It's just how the how the if you will the cookie is cut or the pie is cut that is is part of what's happening too, for what it's worth. Awesome, great. Now let's get down to the firm level for a minute. Uh, this is from uh, Clay Christensen and, and his colleagues back in two thousand eight in the Harvard Business Review. Had this wonderful. Uh, 
uh, article that talked about how uh, financial tools are, are stopping uh, innovation growth. And this to me highlights a couple of really important things and we'll add to it. Um, so you see on the top level here, it's the projected cash stream from investing in innovation. We've all seen these, you know, may have a hockey stick to it, may not, right? Uh, that's A as it goes up and up and up. Now B is the assumed cash stream from doing nothing. But anyone who uh, thinks about it a bit or looks at the numbers over time as, as uh, you know, any investor would, is you see a fade rate, right? Unless you keep reinvesting, you fade back down to the normal return at a company level and then within a market as well, right? You can't, it's it, unless you have monopolistic power or, or any number of certain, you know, unique dynamics, um, you're going to see competition. And so the more likely cash stream is actually not B, which is assumed to be flat, but C. So when people go for money and they look at this kind of cash flow or net present value, it assumes the comparison between B and A, that is between the steady cash stream of today and the projected cash stream. And as Niccolo Machiavelli said so long ago in The Prince, he said, you know, there's nothing hard, and I'm paraphrasing, there's nothing harder to do than something new because the people who have the established thing point to the stable and the people who are doing the, the new thing, if they're honest, say it's contingent and it's got some uncertainty in it. So you have the stable versus the contingent and then you have this, you know, B cash stream, which is empirically total madness, but this is how we do it, Right. The comparison they should be making, they make the point in this article, is over here on the right, which is between the the degraded, the natural degraded, naturally degraded C cash flow and A, which is the potential. And uh, as Ted Levitt said so brilliantly in his book, The Marking Imagination, he said the natural tendency toward all relationships, including marriage, is toward degradation. So C is a natural phenomenon. Right, that just happens. When it doesn't happen, it's rare and weird, or has something else to do with things. So, this think about the microstructure of what's going on, and it's it's wrong. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce time. This article talks less about time. Rob and I are really interested in, in matching time to value, and so what I'd like to do now is to have a poll where we can look at what is the time frame that is typical in your organization, or if you're an investor, when you think about investing, what is the, when you look at a business case, how long is it before there's payoff? What is the typical payoff time frame? One year, two years, five years, or seven years? So folks could do that, could look at that, that would be great. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, no, sounds good, I think. Submit. Okay. Got quite a battle going on. Yeah. The, this is uh, great. The, the votes coming in. You know, John, it's interesting well, that while people are voting, and you know, the idea yes. of, of um, you know, when you think about innovation, you think about this chart. It's, it's interesting because sometimes people miss the idea that sometimes innovation, if innovation keeps your cash flows the same, is incredibly powerful, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of times when you look at companies that are great innovators in the way that we look at them in terms of return on assets and, right, return and, and sustained profitability, it's the companies that consistently innovate well have flat ROAs. It's not that their ROAs shoot off like rocket ships. It's that they have high returns above their cost of capital, you know, 20, for instance, like Facebook, right, 40 or 60% returns. The fact that they're able to persist is what innovation is. And people who, will, and right. when you miss that picture of the the fact that yes. right, it's the what would the decline likely be without, you're missing the understanding of really correctly judging how good that innovation is. Also, mm -hmm. well, this is wonderful. The uh, this is the, I think that we've got a I, I would say a bit of a selection bias here because when I do my polls, you know, of folks, it's usually on the order of one year, two years, maybe three years. But it's great that over half of our folks are saying it's five years. That's great news uh, because uh, we're going to get to the, we're going to get to a point later that we think that five years is probably right for most companies as you think about MPV. Uh, let me take you through um, some of the implications of this as we sit and we compare. Um, 
Microsoft and IBM. So this is data where if you look at uh, the revenue from 2011 through 2020 for Microsoft and IBM, you can see that uh, back in 2011, uh, IBM was just under $100 billion. I think they're 90 and change. And uh, Microsoft was about 70 billion. And then as you go through, you can see increasing growth for Microsoft in the period of 25, 20, you know, 2016, go down a bit, and then pretty sustained growth since Satya Nadella get in in 2017 and going forward. Okay, that's interesting. You know, IBM is getting focused. They're doing share buybacks and so forth, right? They're doing a number of things. Uh, and at the same time, they're advertising a lot about Watson and, and other activities. Uh, I, and, and this probably means I should get a, a, a life, but I find this, this, uh, this chart on the bottom really depressing and, and really makes me sad because if you look at IBM down the bottom here, you see IBM in 2011 has capitalized R&D just over $20 billion. And by 2020, they've brought that down by a few billion. I think it's almost 5 billion. Think about what's going on in the marketplace during this time. Cloud is rocketing. Uh, mobile's going crazy. There's, a, there's tons of customers who would really not like to buy cloud services from Amazon because, gee, if I'm in the pharmacy business or I'm in the retail business or I own a brand, do I really want to be buying cloud services from Amazon? I mean, Amazon Basics, uh, my wife and I moved out here to Chicago to be near our kids and our grandkids. This house, my house is half of Amazon Basics. It's just, it's, you know, they're, they're just vertically integrating it to all these things. And then, so let's say you're Nordstrom's. Do you really want to be buying AWS? No, I want to buy it from IBM. But what's IBM doing? They're disinvesting and they're losing market share and shrinking at the very time that this overall business is growing. And so what happens to Microsoft during this time? They're investing. And you look at how much they're investing. Their capitalized R&D went up over about $30 billion. Now, what is this? This is Surface. This is Azure. This is cloud. This is AI. Uh, this is new data centers. Uh, you can see a similar chart for Google. What's Google doing? Google's actually building things. Uh, they so Google, if you you followed the whole uh, neural network revolution, right? They've created it's the Tensor uh, uh, processor. So when uh, when the CEO of Google said that we're going to put AI in everything, made everybody available on the cloud, the people who run the data center said, if you do that, the data centers are going to melt because the amount of processing power necessary was so great. So they actually redesigned hardware and now they're one of the biggest hardware manufacturers because they're, they're creating very, very efficient hardware chips to do the AI on the chip. And their data centers are unbelievably efficient uh, in, terms of not, in terms of speed and cost per transaction, but also in terms of the electronic, uh, the consumption of heat and electricity per transact per mit per you know millions of instruction per second because the human brain's about i think it's about 10,000 times if you think about a neural connection as a as a as a uh, as a, a a a transaction in a, a you know mathematical transaction in a computer then this this guy is about five or six orders of magnitude more energy efficient even though it consumes about 20% of the energy in your body it's about it's about five orders of six orders of magnitude more energy efficient than the most efficient computer. Well, what Google's done is that now they're starting to actually be an order of magnitude or two closer to the efficiency of the human brain in terms of processing information. So uh, again, um, th that's another whole conversation. I don't believe that, I think mind and mind and computation are different things for another day, mm -hmm. but just from a, from a, where does that R&D go? It's going at the core of their cloud services, which are just dominating, and the core of intelligence services, which are just dominating, and they're putting intelligence everywhere. So these aren't small things, and these opportunities are certainly available to IBM. And this chart, at a time that I think we need more companies in the world who are based in Western values, who have, who have a non-advertising-driven model, because I think advertising-driven models are kind of funky, 
You've only got Apple, Microsoft, and I'd like to have IBM in there, but they're just, and, and why is this the case? Rob, go out, why is this the case? Yeah, and the, the case is an issue of alignment. Because I mean, to your point there, John, the, the core thing that, that you're talking about, every single thing you talked about, IBM was there first, right? IBM with Watson was there first for AI and big data, you know, in terms of cloud and data management, and they didn't invest. And the reason why is this, is this twofold thing. One is IBM, and this comes to the question about share buybacks earlier, IBM management has been compensated on EPS for decades. And specifically, they only fix their compensation metrics to be EPS adjusted for share buybacks literally maybe three years ago, if memory serves me correctly. So, so, what every, so whenever anybody got into IBM from a management team perspective, Romedy, et cetera, the easiest solution, buyback shares, right? Don't reinvest in the business because EPS will reward me if I shrink my share count I will continue to grow EPS even as my revenue, as John showed, as my revenue is declining, right? And so even when they fix that, they've just been so far behind the curve and they're st still misaligned because they're comped on things like EPS as opposed to investing, that this is the one issue. And the other thing is, when you look at people like Microsoft and people like um, Google, companies like Google, et cetera, Amazon, and this, John, is something that you could really speak to, but the other thing is, is it's not just alignment for them is that they still have the right people in key stakeholder positions, meaning founders who are thinking about investing correctly. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because the, um, um, you know, some years ago I did this book with Mitch Cohen on the self-made billionaire effect. So we looked at um, people who've made massive fortunes in the context of, of new markets. And one of the things that you saw, and you see it certainly in tech, and you have to remember that, um, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Apple, and uh, Facebook. Facebook uh, represent, I think, about what 20, 25 percent of the market capitalization of the entire market, something like that. Anyway, it's yeah. it's up there. Yeah, it's I a, think it's yeah, I think it's right around twenty twenty one. Yep. Yep. So it's it's massive. That they are still either founder led or the founder is still in the picture. So. You know, if Satya Nadella goes to the board of Microsoft and wants to make an R and D investment and has Bill Gates on his side, right? Even though Gates, I think, just stepped off the board. I think that the Microsoft board is going to continue to do it. And certainly if Jeff Bezos says, hey, look, I want to I want to stay in the Kindle. Because you think about back the Nook, which is put out by Barnes & Noble, was actually a better reader than the Kindle was. But the Nook, you know, they – Amazon was able to stay at it. And actually, Amazon, like 50, over 50% of our folks who voted here, has a five-year payback period, which goes all the way down to uh, the, you know, even the manager level, that if you're putting a, uh, an innovation out, you have five years on your payback. And so that yeah, and activity. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, just to, just to speak to that, John. You know, it's funny. I'm I'm forever a shill to Northeastern, um, a shill for Northeastern, I should say, as a as an alumni and still hiring co-ops, and our co-ops even who had worked at uh, Amazon. We would interview people for co for co-op interviews. They would come in, and their whole entire language that they would talk about from a co-op perspective. And for those of you who don't know, those co-ops are basically six month paid internships that um, mm -hmm. companies employ people to do. They were even talking in terms of everything we think about is free cash flow and five year paybacks. And how do we think about what is the life of this investment, be it physical or intangible? What is the life of the uh -huh. innovation that we're doing and what's the payback for that? So, I mean, 100 percent just lines up how Bezos and has basically put that mindset of innovation and understanding the life of innovation in there. Absolutely. And again, I want to encourage folks, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them as we go along, especially if there's anything in here. Uh, but I, um, I look at this as, a, as an American business person, and it makes me very, very sad. I mean, this to me is short termism in a very vital area for the, for, the, for the world and for the country. And it's just misincentives that are really driving this kind of behavior. It's not lack of capability. Um, so, um, when you think about changing your firm's timeline, um, we think about it as, Hey, there's the hard way and the easy way. And the hard way is really about, uh, you know, doing the uniform accounting measures and so forth to do adjusted numbers for resource allocation and performance evaluation. And in this, um, this varies actually by industry. And if you want to take the empirical work, uh, the empirical work of a guy by the name of Baruch Lev, 
a uh, guy wrote things like this, the end of accounting. And um, what he did is looked at the empirical, uh, the empirical uh, fade rate that, so you get the proper amortization schedule. So you say, okay, I spend money in intangibles or I spend money in R&D. How long does that keep me away from the equity fade rate? And that becomes basically how long your innovation lasts in terms of economic return. And again, Rob, feel free to interrupt or, or correct me on this thing. So, uh, and that varies by industry, right? And then that work was taken and augmented some at Credit Suisse and augmented some at Valens. And so there's a, as you think about different industries, and I'll let Rob get into this, your, the, the hard way here actually should be adjusted for what kind of industry you're in. Now, the industries I've, I've lived in, services industries, consulting industries, it's five years. So now if you're working at Accenture or you're working at PwC or you're working at, you know, Boston Consulting Group or Digital Intent and you're making a capital investment, it's five years is the is the right time to amortize uh, research and development. And when you think about it, that makes sense. And we'll, we'll get into some some other things to think about as we get into the easy way as well. Uh, now for pharma, I think, Rob, what was the year? What was the timing? Yeah, for pharma, it's 11 years. And if you even think about it, it makes sense, right? I mean, it's because it's not just about the life of from when you identify a molecule to when you get to an approved therapy, right? But it's also mm -hmm. about the idea of when you think about in pharma, it's the additive nature of R&D investment, right? Which is part of the reason why it really is investment when you stop and you think about it. Even if you have a failed molecule, you know, we always think about pharma asset, right? Pharma asset, which is acquired by Gilead. If you have a failed molecule, but then that molecule is additive in terms of you understanding how you can basically innovate on top of that, what you know you don't, don't need to do, that can be so powerful. And that's why you see that 11 year life and the persistency of the impact of R&D on revenue in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And if you go back to where these numbers came from, right, though that is the recapitalization of the R&D, then amortized down and if you look at IBM at the micro level, what you would see is in you know these years, like let's say between 2015 and 2016, you would see that they had disinvested. That is, their their fade rate would be four years because they're a technology company, right? So if they had if their stock was 20 billion dollars, that they had not reinvested four billion dollar five billion dollars to stay even on their stock of capital R and D. Okay, so that's what you see happening here. Whereas you can see the net increase by Microsoft, Facebook, Google, and others. So that's what's going on with this, and uh, and really needs to be adjusted for the industry that you're in. Uh, across industries, using five years is not bad, uh, except when you get into the you know highly researched ones like R and D. Uh, so okay, so that's the harder way. The easier way. Uh, is to first ask, you know, can it be changed or not? Now, you know, I've talked to some friends at private equity and so forth, and they say, look, it's three years, doesn't matter. You know, if you can't do it in three years, you know, you have two choices, do it in three years or work someplace else, right? There's no, <laughs> there's no discussion about the time frame of the payoff uh, for this particular company. So uh, we're not asking you to go on a fool's errand here. Uh, but if you think that there's opportunity to do it, and again, if you're the funder, you'd be thinking about this is the kind of control system, uh, and you can use whatever language you want. Uh, in McKinsey's framework, they talk about the third horizon, first horizon, second horizon, third horizon. And uh, in my reading of that, they basically say, hey, for the third horizon, you can't measure it. Well, uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, what you need to do is you need to time it. You have to say, okay, what's the natural innovation or customer adoption timeline? You know, for example, in uh, in consulting services, the natural customer adoption timeline is on the order of about 18 months. You come up with an idea, you get into a budget, you sell the project, you implement it, right? That takes about five years. If you think about automobiles, new car platforms take about three years to create, about five years to spread around the world. The best in class have brought that down to probably f four or even three years. But there's a natural time. Now, sometimes those can be accelerated, as we're seeing now with uh, the coronavirus vaccine. Fantastic acceleration of the science. But the biggest squish there really is on regulatory approval. I mean, the science was super fast, probably 50% faster. 
or you know more, right? Uh, but then the emergency use authorization took what's usually a three or five year process and brought it down to uh, practically no time at all. Um, so uh, even there, you see some of the natural tendency uh, with our with our global pandemic. So really to ask that because you know we may want uh, we might, may want you know new tomatoes every two days or every week or whatever, but it doesn't work that way. So first look at that, then make that case to the longer timeline. And I think this is really important. Then tell your funders, look, here's the non-financial and quantitative measures. And this also comes from our experience with ventures and so forth. And people talk about stage gates, minimal viable product, all that other stuff. But you say, look, I'm not, I'm not asking to be not accountable. I'm just asking to be accountable for the things that can yield in a reasonable amount of time. So I think that's very different than saying, hey, I don't know. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, dismissing serendipity. Right, we know the story of post-it notes. Right, they're going for a very, uh, you know, strong glue, and they found that the stuff didn't work. You know, it, didn't, it only kind of half glued something, and it took the genius of 3M to say, "Hey, look, how about if we use this as a temporary stick?" And, and post-it notes were born. So, you know, there's still serendipity, but tell your funders, look, if if you know, for example, in services, I need four or five years. If we're going to commit to some database service and so forth, we need four or five years to know if this thing's going to be viable. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and then, uh, and that's really important. And I think that also, my experience has been is that when you come back and you say, "Look, I want to be measured. This is one of you want to be measured on." You have much more of a chance of getting the funding that you want over the time frame than you want than if you simply say, "Hey, look, uh, trust us." And, and John, I think that speaks to, um, so Panita has a question here, basically asking, you know, what indicators suggest when it makes sense to shift course? And how do you think about long-term innovation? I think you, you know, you spoke to it. It's the idea of, it's, you don't wait for the financial indicators because, right, anything that shows up in an account, an accounting statement is an outcome, right? It's actually not what's happening. It is a result mechanism, but it's, all, it's identifying for whatever, whatever innovation you're doing, right, John, it's identifying what are the quantitative non-financial variables what are the metrics that you actually should be monitoring over time that says, I'm probably going to get the financial outcome that I want in the right period, right? Be it five years or be it 11 years for pharma, et cetera. But there's metrics that you can measure that aren't financial in the, me in the meantime, and that's going to vary, right? Depending on which kind of project, what kind of industry you're in, what you're trying to get. But it's, you need to define those first and make sure that you communicate to your management so you can get that buy-in. Here's what you should judge me by, and here's why. Sorry, John, just wanted right. to highlight that from the question. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I think for me, it's what's kind of fun is that, look, uh, I know that the, you know, my colleagues in the venture part of our business and all and, and so forth have really had good experience with corporates. And, and you've, you've also seen this, you know, written by other people about taking a venture mindset in. So I think of some of those as non-financial quantitative measures, you know, stage gate funding, you know, you get your next whatever. What's cool here is you can then integrate that into traditional budgeting and, and capital budgeting and so forth rather than sitting over on the side because running a stage gate process and a, and a continuous process is kind of hard. And this to me is like the universal joint that connects those two things together in a way that, that, that makes sense. Uh, Meredith uh, Page asked a question around, said this kind of innovation is caught between tech and non-tech product development cycles and expected payback. I, I Let me guess it. Uh, not quite sure what the question is in there. I think the notion of the tech and when you have, when you have, let's say a hybrid product, if you will, like part tech, part non-tech and the payback cycles might be different. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and I think that the, the thing, and one of the things that, that really thought about a lot in this is think about innovation as not a product, but as an innovation system. So you take somebody like Starbucks mm -hmm. and it's not just the coffee. Starbucks had a business model where they, um, where they had a very small footprint. So they got cash on cash return in about um, three months, three to six months. The original stores were only 300 square feet. So they, they didn't have to franchise because of that, because they could get their money back very quickly. They had uh, eco-friendly sourcing on the coffee. They had, uh, better labor practices, so they had a better person behind the counter, uh, th and so uh, they they were they had a number of different things together. So Meredith, I would think that if you look at the business system, so any innovation is really a system, right? It's 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 a thing 
but it's a thing, it's a bunch of services or capabilities or unique uh, value uh, propositions around that system um, that make it work. So I think that, uh, I don't think I'm answering your question directly, but I think that you, you need to look at what's the time cycle of that system over time. It has technological and non-technological components. Um, interesting question here about uh, the CVS investment in AI research. I think it's a fascinating question. Um, I have some thoughts, but Rob, I know you've looked at CVS a bit and so forth, but you want to? Yeah, I mean, I'll give I'll give two cents. And, um, you know, and the thing is what CVS has done really over the last, I'll say, five years, but really since the Aetna acquisition, I mean, that, that AI sliver is just a small part of it, which is they're yeah. recreating what, if you look, what United Healthcare did over the last 10 years. Uh, in terms of building Optum and understanding they are no longer a pharmacy, PBM, healthcare, um, based healthcare insurer business, right, um, managed care business. They are a healthcare data business. And so all of this is really center, centering around how do we actually use that data better? And then also how do we also, quite frankly, monetize that data better? And that's where I think a lot of that investment is. And it's really why, in our view, CBS is one of the most interesting companies from a healthcare innovation perspective that I think is out there right now, because they basically have the best data, if you want to look at it from a healthcare perspective, because they can tie in together, you know, these things about the idea of one, just what's happening from a healthcare providing perspective, what are people taking, but also they can understand these ideas of things called social determinants of health, and other things yeah. that, and how you're spending in retail, et cetera, that ties your whole entire life together, so they get better healthcare outcomes for you and can better find it. So sorry, John, I hope that wasn't a little too long, but I think it's super interesting. No, absolutely. And it, and it yeah. highlights, yeah and it, hi yeah, and it highlights how what they're thinking about is how do they innovate to create this new business and what are the metrics that they want to monitor to do it? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic example of what, where we started, which was the move toward intangibles as to where the value is. Uh, look, I still need mm -hmm. that molecule in my body or the service or the injection or whatever, but a lot of the differential value is moving over to, to that, which is computable. And I, I Rob, remind me, I think it's right that Optum, the part of United Health Services that's data driven, is was over 60%, I think it was like 30% of the revenue and over 60% of the profitability. Do I remember that right, roughly? It's actually even more now um, in terms of for United Healthcare. It started as basically zero. And now at this point, if you add all the pieces of Optum together, it is, yes, sorry, yeah, right, Johnny. Yeah, it's roughly a third and it's roughly more than half. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you can you can see that. So I think that, uh, John, I think it's a, a really important investment for CVS. Um, you know, I think it's it's one of the things I think is going to be interesting is can they create the organizational system to take advantage of that? Because my guess is as they stay in their silos, they could get some incremental improvement, but they won't get the platform value, which will go to another another question here uh, in a minute about platform versus not platform investments. But, you know, one of the things that the and I'm getting goosebumps talking about this, which tells you just what a nerd I am, I guess. But, you know, one of the things that's amazing about companies that really understand this is that um, there's a, um, if you can think about information in a modular platform way, and Amazon back in the 2000s, it was 2004 or five or something like that, Bezos sent out a memo, famous memo in a technical community that said, look, if you don't do things in a services oriented way, an SOA way, so that the person at the, on the website is seeing the same thing that somebody inside would see, so you can publish and subscribe capabilities, then you'll be fired. Okay. You say, that's great. You can build it, but you're not going to build it here. And people got the message. And so the complexity of Amazon versus Walmart in terms of cross selling to me goes way down. And you can feel it. You walk in a Walmart store, you know, I've been a Walmart customer, I, you know, I bought things here and so forth. I feel no continuity. Whereas I walk in Whole Foods and there's continuity. And um, that's because of the art, the information architecture. They thought of it more as a platform and less as silos. And so uh, I, that's another, we will talk more about modular and platform. Uh, but I bring it up now because one of the questions here um, from Doug Stone is the question of close in versus, uh, you know, more platform economics and absolutely. And over the years, Doug, there's been uh, different names for this. Clay Christensen, Clay Christensen called it sustaining versus transformational or disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. 
uh, other people uh, before, including a guy named Michael Tushman talked about it as transformational versus uh, improvement. Um, and, you know, it's it's been around for some time, but I think that that is exactly the right way to think about it is, you know, you know, what are the things that are reinforcing of the now versus transformation? And, and a pet peeve of mine, and I have a lot of respect for, um, for uh, uh, you know uh, the guy who who wrote uh, Hamill, Gary Hamill, guy wrote Core Competence of the Corporation, but I think it's one of the most dangerous ideas in business. Which is okay if you want to kill an innovation. All I have to say is, hey, you know, but it's not what we do today. It's like, yeah, that's why we call it an innovation. We don't have the capability to do it, right? That's what we need to create. There's always a new capability between you and what you have to do to get new value. Now, if you're if you're just building scale and so forth, great core competencies. But core competencies as a notion is a fundamentally conservative, backward-looking way of thinking. Uh, anyway, but uh, but yeah. but uh, kind of fun. Just to say All two right. things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just, just yeah, two things. That John, just one. I mean, that's why that's why the way that you know Joel and I always talk. We always talk about genuine assets as opposed to core competencies, right? It's not uh-huh. core competencies so much as it's what are the genuine assets that you can build multitude of things on. And then two is right that idea of you know small core innovation versus platform and um and you know and, and new as, as you said John disruptive innovation versus you know um, continuing innovation, the idea behind it is we we talk about this idea of you know we used to talk about it at Credit Suisse of what we call the wind down ratio, which is basically saying the wind down ratio is the investments I currently have what are the expectation I can think of of the worth of the value of those investments. Then there is basically, if I continue to invest in what I'm investing now, what could that be worth? And then there's growth investment. So there's almost three different levels of valuing a business and how a market thinks about it. And what you're really mm-hmm. doing there about breaking those apart is you're kind of viewing those three segments just like the market does. Yes. And I think as you fund innovation inside in organizations, this what you should be doing and thinking about that and holding people accountable across the board, but over, you know, for the rules and the time frame of the game they're playing. For your organization. Uh, okay, uh, this also, by the way, interacts with the typical length of time people are in an organization. So the the, the aggregate statistics are people stay in corporations for uh, when you get past the very very top, which can tend to be long tenured, uh, depending upon the position. Uh, they're usually in and out in less than five years. So short time frames, short tenure, you know, it it doesn't bode well. Okay, so. As we think about this, um, I'd like to end in a minute um, on uh, 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 a rest of the story thing. It's, um, I'm going to let you finish this up here, Rob. So let me just give a quick signal to what's going on. Okay. Uh, I hope you found this useful. I know we've only got a couple minutes left. Uh, let me give you an idea uh, of uh, our next one is going to be with Toby Redshaw. Those of you who know Tobes, uh, I think this is a fair characterization tips from a corporate renegade. Toby's been in a number of large organizations doing interesting things and understands how to both politically and budget-wise really get interesting new things done. He's done a ton with 5G, and 5G is going to be a big part of this of this uh, computability of reality. Uh, uh, we've got a, uh, 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 an article we wrote with uh, Rob about growth innovators taking these ideas uh, farther. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I want to say is that the spirit of this uh, in our launch here is if you want an intellectual doggy bag, you want to have a conversation about this topic uh, in your firm and you gather five folks together, which is half a million for those of you who have sat, who have sat Shiva, uh, five folks together, we'd be happy to pipe ourselves in to have part of that conversation. Uh, and last, uh, we are uh, very focused on uh, making this available. So we use the Creative Commons license here, which is share and share alike. Uh, you can reuse it and mix it. Just need to say where you got it from, but you're welcome to use any of the data and concepts in here. And Rob, you can end us with the last story in terms of where long and short came from. Absolutely. And so sorry you may have heard of long and short. Oh. I know, I'm going to be quick. Um, but so, um, you know, you have you've, you've heard of long and short in the purpose of investing in stocks. And you may have wondered, why don't we just say buy and sell? Why do you say you're long and short a, uh, a stock? It all comes back from the Persian Empire. Um, basically uh, centuries, if not um, millennia ago. And the whole entire reason why was the way that they would keep contracts was what was called a tally stick. This is also where we get keeping tally from. And what a tally stick was is you would mark out on the tally stick what basically was a contract. 
to say what it was that you were that you had and then you would break the stick in two and the long part of the stick would be the stock right what you owned the short part of the stick was the foil the short so the long part was owning something the short part was owing something and so those who owed it those who were borrowers those those who were do, who had to do something for the contract they they were short and those who had the ob who were getting the obligation they were long the stock and that's where both stock tally and long and short come from thank you rob that's the rest of the story hope to see you again next uh month and uh please feel free to use this material and we hope this is the beginning of a longer conversation about innovation and growth and may you be long great value thank you so much everybody thanks john thanks rob